Welcome to episode 45 of Sharing Life Lessons. This is season 5. We are one spirit, one soul, and together we are creating a library of stories. I am your host Hamida and I want to bring you stories because stories inspire, stories teach, and stories heal. Listeners, I want to start this special episode today by first remembering Captain Tom Moore of UK. For those who regularly listen to Sharing Life Lessons, our guest from UK, Paul Howden, told us the story about Captain Tom in episode 11. Paul spoke about how Cap- Captain Tom at age 99, or literally one week shy of his 100th birthday, pledged to walk 100 laps, which is almost two and a half kilometers around his garden with his walker. His goal was to collect £1,000 for the National Health Service workers who were bravely fighting COVID on everyone's behalf. The story goes that his quest went viral. Donations poured in from all over UK and as far as United States and Japan. And he raised £40 million. I did say £40 million for the brave frontline workers of UK. At the age of 99, Captain Moore became an instant national hero, all because of the desire to do a simple act of kindness, another life lesson that we can all learn from. He sadly died of COVID yesterday. I want to salute him for leaving behind a ginormous legacy at the ripe age of 100. On behalf of all of us, I say, Rest in peace, Sir Captain Tom Moore. Now over to introducing our guest for today. I have a special guest for you to commemorate the beginning of Black History Month. You will hear how being Black impacted her when she switched schools, but how she made a personal choice to work it in her favor. She's a freedom coach, a speaker, and an author. She coaches her clients on how to live free both professionally and personally. She is the visionary creator of Seven Behaviors, a powerful daily practice that teaches you how to live free at work and in life. Her clients include corporate executives at companies such as Pepsi, IBM, American Express, Disney, Time Warner, and the list goes on. Everyone, let's welcome Stephanie Chick. Stephanie, welcome to Sharing Life Lessons. It is such an honor to have you on as a guest. I have been following you on LinkedIn and I love every bit of what I hear from you, which is why I reached out to you to see if you would be a guest on my show. So thank you for accepting that. And again, welcome on the show. Oh, thank you. I feel so honored. It's great. We haven't had a chance to actually talk, just communicate on LinkedIn. So I am really looking forward to this. Me as well. So Steph, before we start talking, can you please tell us something about yourself? Probably the most significant thing about me is that I am a lover of freedom. And I've always been this way. I love to speak freely, think freely, love freely, and just experience freedom in all aspects of my life. And I have been spending the last seven years teaching people how to be free. I created seven behaviors for living free, and these were the behaviors that really liberated me. Mm -hmm. And so I spend night and day, Clubhouse, LinkedIn, and a lot of different venues, teaching people how to be truthful and be courageous and be detached, be loving, be faithful, be still, and be happy. Because if you can embody these seven behaviors, it helps you liberate your mind and your heart and your spirit so that you can live life exactly how you want it to be. And from my standpoint, that is living free. And my website is sevenbehaviors.com with the number seven. So it's uh, easy to find me there and get all of my resources and videos. That sounds wonderful, Steph. I will have the link to your website in my show notes so that listeners can follow you if they like what they're hearing today. Awesome. Awesome. So I know that we are going to do this a little differently today. Normally, my guests, Talk about this one story that really had an impact on your lives. But I know we are, with you, going to talk about micro stories throughout your lives that had a significant impact on you. 
Yeah. So we are ready to hear your micro stories. Hmm. So to tee this up, what I really believe that freedom is a choice, not a necessity. And I believe that you can also live without freedom. But I made the choice from a very early age that I was always going to live free and I was going to figure out to what degree and that any time that I found myself in any kind of form of enslavement, feeling trapped, fearful, disappointed, that I was always going to figure out a way to get out of it. And I don't know where it came from. I think certain qualities are just innate. And so freedom has always really felt familiar to me and something that I could always lean into. And the very first experience that comes to mind, and I have to tell you, I've never shared this story publicly. Thanks for letting me know. I am humbled that this is the platform you're going to share it on. Me too, because I feel so comfortable with you. But at the age of four, I was actually physically sexually abused. And I remember the experience clearly, just as if it happened yesterday. And as you can well imagine at four, you barely have language skills to even be able to articulate what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And, And I remember the confusion and the disappointment because it was a family Uh, member. So it was someone near and dear to me. But it isn't the pain and the disappointment that actually stayed with me. Mm -hmm. What stayed with me is the choice I made after it happened. So I was with a cousin and I remember the only thing I wanted to do afterwards was go outside and play. And I made a choice even though I knew in my mind and that four-year-old mind, something happened that didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be enslaved by that experience. I wanted to reclaim the joy and the, the happiness that I had before the experience. And so I asked my cousin, let's go play. And we went outside and we saw our two tricycles and we got on those tricycles and we rode. I mean, hair blowing, We had these little uh, matching dresses on and we just rode around and around the block over and over again. And I was ecstatic because it wasn't that I was trying to block out what happened. Mm. What I'm trying to do was decide what could I do? What control did I have? And what I knew is I had control over maintaining my own happiness. So I remember saying, After that um, experience, I'm never coming back, obviously, to this house again. I knew that at four, never coming back here. Mm -hmm. But what I'm taking away from this is the fact that I have control over how I can respond when difficult things happen to me. I don't know how at four, I was able to put all that together, Mm -hmm. but I did. And it never defined me. It never confined me. And I moved on with my life. Clearly at a later age, I processed it all, but I do remember that sense of power that I felt on my tricycle to ride through that pain. First of all, I would like to show you my gratitude, Steph, because by telling the story here, you have converted the space into a safe space. Secondly. That is a very sad story, but what you did with it sounds amazing. So I heard you say three things here. I heard you say freedom, Mm -hmm. choice, Mm -hmm. and I heard you say power Power. and control actually. So can you bring these four different concepts or ideas together? Because it seems like they do go together. They do. I think it all starts with the choice. And when I said that somehow I was born making the choice that I would always live free, not that I would always have control over things that happened to me, but that I would have 100% control on how I responded to them. 
-hmm. And that's what brings me power. And that's what brought that four-year-old child power is because even though that happened to me and I didn't have the language to say no or to confront an adult, what I did have the power on is that you're not going to take my joy away from me. Incredible. So yeah, that was the first choice. And I can actually tell you that it has been empowering for the rest of my life because of the fact I was courageous enough to have control over my mind and my emotions, even though, again, at four, I don't even know how I did that, but I did. And it always stuck with me. The universe was with you at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, So tell us other instances or micro stories where you had two paths to take and how that came about. So then the next story is another childhood story that I remember. And it was when my parents moved us from the city. I lived in Kansas City. So we were in in the urban area to the suburbs. And it was because the schools were always striking. Mm -hmm. And every three months, the teachers were on strike. And my mother, who was adamant about getting a quality top-notch education, said, I got to move my kids out of here because they're never going to get out of school because of all the striking that's going on. But the challenge was that she was moving us from an inner city area, which was very diverse, to the suburbs in the mid 70s. And she said, it's not going to look like the neighborhood that you're used to growing up with. And, you're, you know, it's probably going to be a little bit of adjustment, but we're going to be OK. So this is the beginning of sixth grade. Mm-hmm. So my mom takes me, walks me to school and I walk in and the school is white. I'm not talking a little white. I'm talking all white. And That's, I know exactly what you're saying because <laughs> I moved us from New York City to a suburban area in New Jersey just for that reason, because the schools are better here. Right. And in my township as well, when my daughter started kindergarten, she was the only Indian child there, only. The rest were all white. Right. I I can relate to that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's a sticker shock, so to speak, when you walk in the classroom and you don't see anyone looking like you. Mm -hmm. Well, what was interesting is the teachers had never taught a Black child. And they thought that they needed to have a conference with my mother to get some (laughs) some tidbits (laughs) or feedback on how to teach a black child, which I, looking at it now is like hilarious, Hilarious. Um, that it was that big of a shock for them that they felt they needed to have a conference about how to teach a black child. So my mother conveyed this to me and just said, don't worry, it's going to be okay. But I distinctly remember them saying, we're sorry, you know, but you're just a little bit different. And we just want to make sure that we understand how to sort of deal with my differentness. And in that moment, I remember thinking, well, if you think I'm different, it's not going to be just because of the color of my skin. I'm going to choose how different I want to be. And the difference that I made in that moment is that I was going to be excellent. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I have all the spotlight on me, then I'm going to be excellent. And Mm -hmm. so I just started getting involved in everything in the school. And as my son said, you became one of those kids. I said, yeah, I was on student body and I was in drill team and I was national honor society. And I remember by the time I got to high school, I was no longer different for being black. I was different from being excellent. Mm -hmm. And I got an opportunity to apply to be the class speaker. And they said, Stephanie, you did a wonderful job. We love the words that you want to convey, but you speak too fast. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is give your speech to Lori and let Lori give your presentation. And I was just like, are you kidding me? And I said, well, what do I have to do? And they said, well, either you let Lori give it or you come in and you work with us for two months and slow down and work on your presentation skills and then we'll let you present. Again, I made the choice 
that no one is going to define what happens for me. And I said, I will do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of broke free from all of the things that I had acquired and thinking that I'm it to saying, I will do what it takes. And I met with the speech teacher for two months and we hammered it in. And to this day, Lori and I are still really good friends. And I told her, you almost took away my shot. And I wasn't going to let you take away my shot. And I think that's what's important is that at every moment, you get a chance to define who you are, Mm -hmm. not someone else. And so I didn't want the school to define me solely based on my skin color. And I also think it was important for me not to define myself by my past successes. And that if I was in a situation where I needed to learn and grow, I needed to be able to humble myself to do whatever was needed to bring myself back up to the level that I knew I could perform at. Stephanie, do you think that there is ever a time in your life that you really did not have a choice? That everything was out of your control and nothing that you could do could make a difference? That's a very interesting and and thought-provoking question. The only time that I have never felt like I have a choice is in following truth. If you think about all of, you know, the story of being four years old or the story of moving to the suburbs and even the choices that I'm, I'm making today, it's all in following truth moment by moment. And I don't feel a choice to do anything other than that. Like, I don't feel like there's any other option. It is that truth that brings me success. It brings me fulfillment. It brings me inner alignment. It brings me peace. Um, It brings me the power that I was talking about. The thing is, you never know how truth is going to show up. And my surrender, so to speak, is to embrace it in whatever form it is. Mm. You're not good enough. You got to work harder. That's truth. Truth that you're not going to let someone define you. That's truth. So whatever form it is, I'm going to surrender to that. And that's something that I don't feel like I have any other choice but to do that. So truth is really the guiding principle of your life. It is. It is. And then you make your choices based on that to achieve the freedom that you're looking for. Absolutely. It is my anchor. It is my beacon. Both. I don't try to make truth anything other than what it is. And so have there been times when I have misled myself, sent myself off in the wrong direction? Yes. Because in that moment, that was my truth. Like my truth was whatever I was seeing. Mm. And it wasn't until I got to the end of the cul-de-sac that I could turn around and go, whoa, wait a minute. I'm way off track. But in that moment, it was my truth. And I think operating from that standpoint gives yourself permission to be free. I'm not worried about my mishaps misjudgments, errors. It's my humanity. It's my freedom. That makes sense. Do we have another story? I think the other story, it gets, it's a great segue in terms of the, my professional life. I started out my career at IBM straight out of college. I, I got a, was blessed to have a, an internship and it turned into a full-time position. So I was really blessed. And you can imagine someone graduating from college and getting a job with a Fortune 500 company and IBM nonetheless, I just thought I had died and gone to heaven. And I expected <laughs> to um, be at that company and you know get my pin and retire. And that was, I was done. Mm-hmm. However, about three years in, I realized, I don't know if this is it. And I didn't want to leave. There was a little bit of fear then. But I was definitely ready to push the envelope a little bit. 
And so I was in a sales position and I had some ideas and thoughts on how we could do a better job at selling and marketing. And I put together this whole great pitch, went into my boss's office and pitched it. And he said, Stephanie, great enthusiasm, really good thoughts, not the way we want to go. Basically, go back out to the bullpen, get on the phone, start making calls. You're young and, you know, when it's your time, you can mm. come to the office and give your ideas and thoughts. And in that moment, I thought, you know what? I don't want to wait. Like, I want to implement the things that I want to do and I want it now. And they were having some packages that they were giving to more senior um, members, but it, there was an opportunity for me to take advantage of it. So what I did is I decided that I would leave. So at 29 years old, I decided to leave corporate America and to go off and start to figure out what it was that really mattered to me and to be able to start implementing the ideas and vision that I had for myself was that moment that I realized I could control my own destiny and that I didn't need a big company and all the power and prestige and the pedigree of a Fortune 500 company to define me. Mm -hmm. um, that started me on this whole journey of, to where I am today. Because once I was courageous enough to do that and walk out at 29, I knew I could do it again and again and again, which is essentially what I did. I went from corporate America to a nonprofit just because I wanted the opportunity to have a low tech client. It's like, okay, uh, I went to Girl Scouts and I'm like, I want an opportunity just to work and make girls fulfill their highest potential. And it, it was a great opportunity. And again, it just gave me that moment where I realized that I didn't have to wait. I think women think sometimes that they have to wait to make choices. And I didn't want to wait. Again, that's where it brought me to where I am today. It, it's awesome that you were able to have that courage to do that. Steph, for those who are in a situation where they feel trapped, but they also feel the fear of the unknown, what if I leave this and I can't get to something better than this, so I'd rather stay with the devil I know than the devil I don't, but they're still feeling trapped. Tell me how you think they could collect that courage to really get out of the jail. How did you get that courage? I think it comes in steps and stages. And first, just, you know, being able to acknowledge that you're in fear and that you want to get to that next stage. But I think you also have to have this perspective that getting to what you want matters more than the fear that you're going to have to go through to get to it. I think we sometimes think that getting from A to B is supposed to be comfortable. And I think what I learned really early on through the choices that I've made is that I've grown to always be comfortable being uncomfortable. That sometimes the knees are going to shake mm -hmm. and sometimes you're going to feel this dis-ease, but that you just take that right along with you as you're moving step by step to wherever you want to go. Okay, okay. Steph, all of these stories that you've told us and we're calling them micro stories, each had a lesson in it that you learned. I'm hoping you can bring it all together and share those life lessons with the listeners. I think the common theme through all of my micro stories, again, from my life's perspective, there's not been this one big story that has really defined and shaped my life. It's just been everyday life experiences. But as we talked about at the beginning, I think the most important thing for me has to be a choice moment by moment to go in whatever direction I'm being led to go. And I think that if you don't fully use the power of choice, 
then you leave your life to chance. Mm. I remember um, a friend of mine calling me and we were talking about some good things that were happening for me professionally in my business. And she said, you know, how did you do all this? Like, I can't understand how you had this great um, corporate career, then you're off doing your own thing in terms of your own private coaching practice. Like what's behind all of that? And I said, I was just courageous enough moment by moment to make conscious choices, fully aligned with exactly the way I wanted my life to be. Like there's nothing more mysterious or special than that, Mm -hmm. is that choice by choice in every moment of my life that I realized early on from the age of four that I was responsible for my life and that no matter how difficult the situation is, that you always have the power of choice. Mm. I love this quote from Stephen Covey in the book, The Eighth Habit, where he says, between stimulus and response, there lies a space. And in that space lies our freedom to choose our, our, our destiny and to choose whether we want to be happy or we want to be depressed or choose to be enslaved or to be liberated. It's that space. And I think in most cases, people sort of bypass the space. There's a stimulation and they go to a conditioned response Mm -hmm. or habitual response. And I've always tried to sit in that space. I call it the void. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people want to avoid the void. I've never wanted to avoid it. I'd love to go into that space and say, okay, in this space, I have the power to choose. What do I choose? That is such a powerful question to ask yourself. Just step back, take that space and ask, Mm -hmm. I am in that space. I have to make a choice. What do I want to do? Yes. And I think in most cases, people know what they don't want, Yeah. but they don't focus on what they want. And that seems so simple um, and so obvious. But every time I ask a client that question, oftentimes they get stumped on the, what do I want? What I don't want, they can go on forever. Mm -hmm. But to make the choice to say, this is what I want. And then to be courageous enough to pass through the fear, all the unknown, all the mystery, all the messiness. And I think that's the other thing. Life is messy. And I've made the choice to be okay with that mess on my way to whatever um, goals or dreams that I've wanted to accomplish is that it's okay to be in the mess. Let me ask you this final question. Steph. Sure. Regret. You've made your choices. Mm-hmm. You go along the path. Is there any time where you've looked back and felt regret for the choice that you've made? And if you did, what did you do about it? I think the one of the most important choices I've tried to make that I know I have failed um, miserably at times is the choice to love. And if there's anything that I have regret on are the times that I didn't lead with love because I think that is the most powerful force in the world. And every time I have chosen to love in my relationships, following work that I love, loving myself, there's always been a positive outcome. So I have regret around that, but I also now have confidence. Like I figured it out Mm -hmm. through all those bad choices that I made when I didn't lean into love, I've learned. So now I always create that space when I feel my heart shutting down or that I'm not being as open and kind as I wanna be. I now know how to create that space so that I can choose the most loving option in every moment. So basically you're saying we may not always make the right choices. Mm Mm-hmm. But every wrong choice that we make 
could be an opportunity to learn from it. Absolutely. And it's the application of what we learn is most important. We often learn, we learn every day, mm -hmm. but that's only half of the equation is how do we apply what we learn? And that's what I'm trying to be better at every day is make a choice. And when I make the wrong choices that are, aren't fully aligned is learn from that and then apply that going forward. Lovely, lovely. Steph, before we end, may I please ask you to say that quote that you said earlier about the space, which you call the void? Oh, so the space. Um, and this came from the book from Stephen Covey, The Eighth Habit, that in between um, stimulus and response, there lies a space. And in that space lies our freedom to choose. And that has guided my life ever since I read that. I thought it was profound that I've tried to keep that space open enough for me to make sure that I'm choosing things that are 100% aligned with how I want my life to be. It is a profound quote. And thank you so much for this beautiful conversation, Steph. Really enjoyed talking to you. And again, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Listeners, I hope you found this discussion as interesting as I did. Before I list my key takeaways from it, I would like to reiterate that I'm really humbled that Stephanie chose to use this space as a safe space. And I welcome all of my listeners to use it as such whenever they feel the need. And now, here are my key takeaways from my discussion with Stephanie. One, you may not have control over what happens to you, but you can have 100% control over how you respond to what happens to you. Two, we learn every day, especially from the bad choices we have made, but that is only half of the equation. The important thing is how we apply what we have learned. Three, no matter how difficult the situation is, you always have the power of choice. So have the courage to make conscious choices moment by moment. And lastly, I have almost fallen in love with Stephen Covey's quote. So here it is again. Between stimulus and response, there lies a space. And in that space lies our freedom to choose our destiny. And so I ask you, are you going to use your power of choice? Or are you going to leave your life to chance? This brings us to the end of this episode. I will bring you another episode of Sharing Life Lessons next Wednesday. Until then, be happy, be safe, and be well.